Good evening, everybody. How's everyone doing tonight? Thumbs up. Can't see facial expressions, so thumbs up for good. All right, it's really nice to have everyone here tonight. We want to welcome you. Those of you watching online tomorrow, we want to welcome you as well. We're glad you're able to share the service with us tonight. And I would ask each of you to bow in prayer as we get going this evening. Father in heaven, we want to thank you again for another opportunity to be here. We know, Lord, it's not under the most optimal circumstances, but we know that you're here with us. Father, we know that your spirit is here with us, and we know that each of us, Lord, hopefully would have come tonight with an open heart and mind to be able to hear your spirit and your word spoken to us. And as we're going to have some songs of praise here shortly, Lord, we would lift those up to you as well. We just pray that that would get our hearts and our minds in the right mindset for what you would have for us. We would pray that you would be with John as he's going to bring that message to us as well, just in power and truth and in spirit. And again, Father, we just ask that we have open hearts and open minds to receive that word, not only just to hear it and to think about it, but Lord, that it would be actually something to change our lives and to move us in a closer walk with you and to better serve you as we go about our weeks ahead of us. Lord, we think of our country again. We want to pray for all the leadership that is uh, making decisions from Washington, D.C. to down in Salem, Father, and even locally in Portland here. Lord, we just lift them up. More importantly, we ask that you would put wise counsel in their footsteps, that they would be having ears open to people, giving them good advice, wise advice, and advice that would follow along with what your word would want from um, a society to live by. And Lord, we just trust in you for that. And again, we lift them up in prayer to you. And Father, we just pray for all those who would be hurting during this time. We know it's unprecedented times. We just pray that you would give strength and encouragement. We think of those, especially in our congregation, who have been struggling with sicknesses, Father. We just want to lift them up to you. We want to pray for them tonight and ask that you visit them in a special way. Father, we love you and we praise you. and We anticipate a blessing tonight. We want to commit the time to you in this evening. It's in your name we pray.
was wondering if I was going to be able to get up here without dropping the thing, and it looks like it didn't. Well, I don't know how your week was. Mine was really busy. We had a five and a two year old there since a week ago Thursday, so it was really busy. And uh, Papa didn't have a whole lot of time to himself. But luckily, I, I worked on this sermon before they got here and tried to put the finishing touches on it tonight, as, I mean, this afternoon after they left. Uh, if you think about it, you can pray for Amanda and Isaac. They're going to drive straight through to Phoenix tonight. So they left at 2 o'clock. So hopefully that tomorrow, around noontime, they'll be home. Or even a little before. You know, as I was, I was thinking about uh, things in general, um, most of you probably don't know, tomorrow's my 51st wedding anniversary. And uh, Ben's given me you old. How Carla put up with me that long? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> anyway, I've, I've been in thought about a lot of things and about how my life has changed and wondering if kind of as, as time goes on, if you, if you let your guard down a little bit and maybe you're not as intense as you used to be about, about God and about what he, do, what he does in our lives. So I'm going to entitle the message tonight, No Other God. And I was thinking about uh, doing a series on uh, the no others in Bible, in the Bible, and I'm, I'm going to see how this goes tonight as to whether I will finish and we'll do the rest of them. But I was going to preach about next week, no other name, then no other salvation, then no other gospel, and no other foundation. So I don't know, maybe that's a little bit too, too uh, elementary for us, but I think it's a good reminder. I think we need to, to think about you know, who we are and where we are in our walk with, with the Lord. I'm going to use for our text today um, four verses out of Exodus 1, 20, verses 1 through 4, and then I'm also going to read Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 15. We are living in a time that independence and doing what we want to do is what happens. We should always remember who controls the universe. Our creator, God, Jehovah, reminds us in our text today that there is no other God. I believe in our lives we should be reminded of that fact and spend some time in evaluation and reflection. So I'm going to read the text now. Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments chapter, and then also Deuteronomy 6. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. So when, when Moses went up to Mount Sinai, after the, the Israelites had escaped the captivity in, in Egypt, and saw all the miracles that God had performed, he went up onto Mount Sinai, God called him up there, and he gave him the law. Now, God was a, is a jealous God. He had chosen that nation to be the one that he would bless and that he would serve. So he calls Moses up there, and we know what happened. Those of you who know what the Bible says know when Moses was up there, they're making a golden calf. So God was really concerned about his people. He chose that nation. He chose that nation from Jacob, who he, he, he chose. And these people were the apple of God's eye. And yet this is what happened when Moses was up there receiving the law from him. Now, the other comment I want to make about the law, he, when, uh, when Moses got the law, and when God spoke to him, in the first couple of verses, it says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He didn't tell them, this is what I want you to do. He reminded them of who he was. And I think it's, it's good for us in our lives, too, and it's in my life, too, as I've, I've walked with the Lord for over 51 years, to find out where I'm at. To find out if I am growing, if my love for God has gotten more and more. And, you know, I think about, about marriage. When I think about, um, you know, 51 years ago tonight, I was pretty nervous. Because I was going to walk down the aisle and the next thing I was going to promise my life to, to Carla. I'm not as nervous tonight, 
But I do know that God has taken control of my life. And every one of us should, should be thankful and, and spend some time in reflection. I think that's always, that's always valuable for us if we spend time in reflection, thinking about all the things that God has done. And as I look back over 51 years, I, I can see God's hand in, in all areas of our lives. And I realize that, that um, when I promise to serve him, and he promised to give me everything I need. He's done that in my life. So I, it, I thought it was interesting. He didn't come right out and said, this is what I want you to do. He reminded them who he was and then that they shouldn't have any God before him. And in, in Deuteronomy, you know, we're, we're years into this, cat, in, into this uh, wilderness experience now. And Moses is speaking to the people again. And, he, and, you know, we've been talking about the last few weeks, we've been talking about the great commandment, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. He's, he, this is where this, was, this came about the first time. So let's read uh, Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 15. Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgment which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess. That you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life that your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall walk, talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of all things which you did not fill, hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant when you have eaten and are full. Then beware lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. As I look at this chapter, I realize that, that God knew that the time was coming when the Israelites were going to go into the promised land. He also knew, he knew their hearts, and he knew their, the propensity they had to sin and to, to do things that displeased him. And we know as we study the uh, Israelite people in the wilderness, it's an up and down battle all the way. You know, when they, when they were close to God, things seemed to go well, and when, when things were going too well, then they, they went away from God, and there was trouble. There was always trouble, back and forth, back and forth, up and down. So here... He's talking to them about going into the promised land. The land is flowing with milk and honey. And he wanted them to remember the Lord our God is one. And he, he gave them the great commandment there. And then he said, these words that I command you today shall be in your heart. He wanted them to engrave them, to put them in their hearts. And then it, they, want, they needed to not be hearts of stone. They needed to be hearts that were, were pliable and that God could work with. And in, in verse 7 is an a interesting verse, and it's one that us as fathers and as parents, you know, need to, need to think about. It says, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall walk, talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. It should be the central focus of your life, the fact that God is in control and he is, he's got a plan for us and he, that plan plan came to fruition when Jesus came and shed his life, shed his blood on Calvary. 
They shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And I don't know that anybody does that today, but people should know when they come into our house that we are serving God. And people should know even before they get there, for the, uh, when we have uh, situations with them, when we interact with them, they should know that we love God and He is in control and He's the leader of our house. And He went on to, to tell them, and I thought this was interesting in the next voice, is that you're going to go to this land and you're going to have houses full of good things which you did not fill. Hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant when you have eaten and are full. Therefore, beware lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Sometimes when things are going too well, we have a tendency to forget because we're human beings. And I, you know, that's not an excuse, it's, it's a fact. We do forget when things are going really well. And, and God had, had made this plan for them, and He was going to provide for them. And he wanted them to remember him when they went to the promised land. You know, the biggest uh, struggle that God, he talked about here when Moses talked about them, yes, he wanted them to uh, remember God and his, and his law. He wanted them to remember that he was the only God. There were no other gods. They had, they had a problem with idolatry all the way through and one of the things that he told them was don't intermarry, don't get involved with the people in the other, other nations because you, they will drag you down. And that's what happens in us in our lives too. When we spend too much time away from the Lord, away from his fellowship, we have a tendency. We don't rub off on people, they rub off on us. So, you know, we have a lot of people in this world who uh, define themselves as an atheist. It's a person that believes there is no God. They reject all religious belief and the Bible. They just totally reject it. And then you have the agnostics. They question the existence of God, heaven, etc. In the absence of material proof and are unwilling to accept the supernatural revelation. And a deist is a person who believes in God as a creative moving force, but who rejects formal religion and its doctrines of revelation and divine authority. Now, you probably know someone like that in your life. And there was a man that used to come into our shop years ago back in Maryland, and he, uh, I might have told, I probably told this story before because it sticks out in my mind whenever I think about somebody that tells me they're agnostic. He had a problem with his car. He knew that my dad and I were always four or five weeks behind. If you want to get your car fixed, you, you come in four or five weeks ahead and schedule it. And then if something happened to your car, we try to work it in. So he, he was on our way and he had a problem with his car. And it wasn't anything that was really major. So it was something that I could take care of quick. And he, and he told me, he says, man, I was praying all the way over here that you'd have time to work on my car. And I looked at him and I said, Mr. Taper, who are you praying to? Because you say you don't believe in God. You don't, you don't think God is, is, a, is the creator of the universe. And he, he didn't have nothing to say. He kind of looked down at his shoes. That's what people do when you, you know, tell them something that they, they don't understand. And they kind of then look down at their shoes because they don't want to look at you eye to eye. So he was agnostic. And, uh, you know, we talked about that on occasion when he would come in. And he, didn't never, have, he never had an answer for me. But here, atheism is not the only problem the world faces. And we all, like I said, we all know people like this. The Bible says in uh, Psalm 14, 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is not, none who does good. What is wor worrisome is that many people live their lives as if there is no God. You've run across people like that, haven't you? Who say, there's no God. This is, that's all a fairy tale. One, one kid used to tell me at, at work that uh, he was a young man, probably in his early 20s. He said, yeah, um, Satan and the devil and God, there's things that, that the people made up so they make their kids behave. That, that, that's the way he thought it was. So um, that's worrisome. And, and Psalm 10.4 says, 
The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. Today's text rules out atheism. But it's also concerned with a greater threat, and that's idolatry. Idolatry is the greater threat. Deuteronomy 11:16 says, Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. The Israelites were facing the same problems we face today, other gods. Psalm 115, 4 to 6 says, The idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not, sm do not smell. It's an inanimate being. It's nothing. It's a piece of rock or metal or stone or wood. It has no power. But for some reason, people, those, the Israelite people and some people today worship things that have absolutely no power. They struggled with images of wood, metal, or stone. Things built with their own hands and Romans uh, 1, 21 to 23 addresses that in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul said, because although they knew God, and the Israelite people, they knew God. They knew who God was. They saw the miracles. Most of them, if, if they didn't, weren't eyewitnesses, they saw them when they, they heard from the, the generations, they passed them down, and it's, um, they knew what had happened, it, 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 they heard what had happened in Paul writes, because also they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. That was the world that Paul lived in. That was the world when the Israelites were, were wandering through the, through the wilderness, and that's the world we live in today. God was not pleased with the practices they picked up on their journey. I want you to think about this question, and I thought about this at home when I was meditating on this. What are some of the idols we struggle with today? Now, there's not probably any, anyone here that has a uh, room in their house where they go and they worship and there's some figure in there. I was on a walk one day and this, um, the lady came out and she, I, she was from India. She was an Indian. And, and she came out and she said, could you come here quick? So I walked up her, to her driveway and she said, uh, my, we got to go and my garage door won't shut. Do you, you think you can look at it? So I went in there and I found out what was wrong with it and I fixed it so she could shut it. And I said, you know, I watched this house being built. And she said, I said, you had it built for yourself, didn't you? And she said, yeah. And I said, I was wondering because my boy was looking for a house about that time and I thought this would be a nice one for him. And she said, yeah. And she says, we have, a, we have a Buddha in there and we have a special room to worship him. That kind of took me back a little bit. <laughs> so, you know, there are those things still go on today, but none of us probably in this room have, have faced that or, or had a te temptation to do that. What are some of the idols we struggle with, though? We are not apt to bow down to idols of wood, stone, or metal, but we have other idols to bow down to. Think about what they might be. I, I could have made a long list I jotted a couple things down just so I could remember what I was thinking about. Wealth, money, or striving to acquire wealth. Public acclaim or success. F education, famous people, athletic figures, as the young said. Material possessions, homes, vehicles, boats, campers, vacation home, all kinds of things that the world pushes and, and works for and they have no eternal value when it's all said and done. When, when, the Lord, when the Lord calls you home, 
They will have no eternal value at all. How about our families? You know, I thought about that this week, how blessed I was to have my daughter and her son-in-law and the two grandkids and spent a lot of time with John and Tressa and their boys. Got to, you know, they were around a lot and we, we were at their place a lot and it was just a, a really great time. And, you know, in my house, when we have people over for dinner, I have my own seat. And so I always sit at the head and, and, they, and Emerson wanted to sit at the head and I wouldn't let him and he didn't like that too much. But, um, you know, there, it was such a blessing to have them, have them there. And they, you know, it would have been 100% if Carol could have been here, but she, she wasn't here. But, you know, I, as I looked at my family sitting there and I saw them interacting with each other, I thought about um, how much I loved them. How much I loved them. And, you know, where do they fit into this whole thing? You know, the Bible said here that you should teach them diligently to your children. And so, you know, I, I know I wasn't a perfect father, but I've been blessed beyond, beyond compare when I think about my family and, and what God has been able to do in their lives. But should they come first? Are they the thing that should be first in my life? Should I lift them up? What about Carl? Her and I together are responsible for the children. Do I lift her higher than them? Do I lift them above what, who God is and what he's done and what he's allowed to happen in our lives? Things to think about. You know, sometimes we're, we become proud. We should be thankful. We are on our knees every day that God loves us enough to meet all the needs that we have, especially the spiritual need by sending Jesus to die on the cross. The idols we have today maybe more subtle, but they're just as dangerous. Anything that takes our focus away from God is an, is an idol. It takes the place of God in our life. And for each of us, that's different. I don't know what it is for you. I know what it could be for me if I allow that to happen. We can be blinded by our earthly desires and attitudes. One of the questions I, I asked myself when I wrote those words down, can we have an honest assessment of ourselves? Can we be honest enough with ourselves to be, to tell the truth? Words to think about, not only for you, but for me also. God's commandment to his people is that we should have no other gods. Period. And I have several verses that I want to read. Uh, the Exodus 20, verse 3, says, You shall have no other gods before me. That's, that's pretty cut and dry. I mean, there shouldn't be any question on that one. And then also, uh, 2 Samuel 7, 22 says, Therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, nor is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. In 1 Chronicles 17, 20, O Lord, there is none like you, nor is there any God beside you, according to all we have heard with our ears. Similar verses. And then in Psalm 86, 10, For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. So there shouldn't be any question in our mind if we spend any time at all in the Word that God is the one. And in Psalm 46, 10 says, I am God and there's none else. None else. We have been create, created to have a relationship with God. That's our purpose for living. He didn't have to make humans. He had this perfect world with all these animals and the fish of the sea and all the things he made and he decided to make a human. And he decided to 
On top of that, he decided to give a human a helper. And then he, then he also decided that he was going to give them free choice. Free choice. He wants us to have a relationship with him. He don't want us to be robots. He wants us to love him because of who he is, the creator of the universe. We humans are creatures with a destiny that goes beyond the time we live on this earth. And I think that's one thing that we need to remember as we walk through this road of faith, that we do have a destiny. Our life is not over when we pass from this life and we take our last breath. We have a destiny because that's the way God set it up. And he made all the provisions for us to be able to have a part of that destiny. We, are, we humans are creatures with a destiny that goes beyond the time that we live on this earth. And I'd like to read a few verses out of Isaiah 45 that say, verses 18 to 22, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, Who is God? Who formed the earth and made it? Who established it? Who did not create it in vain? Who formed it to be inhabited? I am the Lord and there is no other. I have spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together. You who have escaped from the nations, they have no knowledge who carry the wood of their carved image and pray to a God that cannot save. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord, and is there no other God beside me, a just God and a Savior? There is none beside me. Look to me and be saved, all ye ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. Look to me and be saved. That's what he wants for all of us. That's what he wants for all the people that live in this world who have lost their way. I was thinking the other day as I was, I was meditating on, on these verses, what would the world be like if everybody had God on the throne of their heart? How different it would be. It didn't have to be like this. But we as human beings have the propensity to sin. And God knew it. And he created us anyway. He created us anyway. Can anyone substitute, can any substitute that robs, robs God robs us of eternal life? Any substitute for God robs us of eternal life. When God is not on the throne of our hearts, evil will prevail in our hearts and our society as a whole. The other gods will always introduce evil into a person's life. They're dead. Satan is the one that's working to create, have people create all those false gods. The third point is this command is both a personal command and a challenge. This is the first commandment, so it should have great value in our lives. The challenge is to recognize and to know the true God and to give one's life to Him. Many people believe in or know about God, but He does not sit on a throne of their hearts. How we spend our time will identify if we have idols in our lives. And it, it was hard for me to write that because it's true. And it, that will hit you smack right in the face. How we spend our time will, will determine if we have idols in our lives. Do we need to learn more self-denial in our personal lives? Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24, Jesus, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone comes, desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Denial. That's what it takes to, to live our life for, for the Lord and for Jesus. It takes denial in our life. But denying self doesn't mean doing without something you want. It means that you take your direction from God's Word and the Holy Spirit. We're not to be people who 
have no wants or desires because we wouldn't be human. But God wants us to want the things that he wants for us in our life. We should take our direction from the word and the Holy Spirit. I have a question I want to leave you with tonight. I want to leave it with myself too. I've been pondering it already on my way over here and when I was sitting in, in the quiet and when, when the house got quiet this afternoon, I had some time to think and meditate. Have you and I sought him first or are there other gods in our lives? That's a sobering question. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, but seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And the closing verse for today is Luke 12, 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is God's pleasure to give you the kingdom. May God bless his word.
So I'll stand for a closing prayer. Our Lord and Father, there is none like you. We're thankful for that. Throughout the ages, human beings, men and women, have looked and searched for meaning and purpose. Oftentimes they have searched in the wrong places and traveled after false gods. And yet you chose through your plan of salvation to reveal yourself to a nation and then to the whole world through your son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the song that just reminded us, Lord, that we can come at his feet. We pray, God, that you would bless every soul that's here tonight, that we would have our minds and hearts refocused on to making sure that you are the one and only in our life, and that our church would reflect that in our attitudes and our perspectives and our priorities, and that we would honor you, Lord, give you the glory you deserve for being the one true God who has made everything and who has saved his people. We ask your blessing on um, as, us as we dismiss now. We pray for your blessing on the gathering tomorrow as well, that again, your, your word would go out, it would be proclaimed, and that it would speak to the heart of each person. We thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. We are going to dismiss now at this time. And so we'll...